This interview is brought to you by OKCoin Crypto Exchange, where you can buy, sell, and trade your favorite cryptocurrencies, and you don't have to pay high fees. OKCoin charges low fees, the lowest in the industry. You can also stake your crypto and keep 100% of the rewards. OKCoin does not charge any fees when it comes to staking. In fact, it is the only exchange where you can buy, sell, and trade Miami Coin and also stake Miami Coin at a high APY, currently at 280%. OKCoin also has a great referral program that if you refer a friend, you guys can split $100 in Bitcoin. So be sure to sign up with OKCoin, link in the description. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel, your home for crypto news and interviews. With me today is Haley Lennon, who's a partner at Anderson Kill, contributor at Forbes Crypto, and founder of Crypto Connect. Haley, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Let's start with your background. Where are you from? Uh, where did you grow up? So I'm from uh, New Mexico and, and Dallas, Texas. I spent most of my childhood in both places. Definitely feel like Dallas is home. But I've been now in California for about 20 years for college and law school and, and practicing crypto law. Um, so I miss Dallas a lot, but uh, definitely feel now like a California girl. Um, and I noticed in your background, your LinkedIn, you know, before you were at Anderson, Anderson Kill, you were at Coinbase. Can you tell us about, you know, your journey from maybe traditional law world and or, or other things and how you got into the crypto industry? Yeah, it was interesting. So I went to law school in San Diego and um, I, I was at a law firm for about a year and really wanted to move more into the financial fintech sector. Um, I had heard about crypto. I hadn't um, like really gone down the rabbit hole yet. And I was working at a traditional currency exchange company. So um Along the Mexico border, there's little exchange centers called Casa de Cambios that um, convert dollars to pesos and back and forth. And um, our company did sort of the compliance due diligence for those exchange centers to um, do wholesale currency exchange for them. So what that really means is it was a very cash heavy business. They had the armored cars. Um, actually transporting the you know millions of dollars to the bank to convert them to pesos for these exchange centers who really couldn't get a bank account otherwise so we were sort of the filter between the exchange centers and the bank and um and silvergate came across my linkedin or resume and reached out to me silvergate um since about since i joined in 2013 has you know really banked sort of the entire ecosystem and they said, what you're doing at your current um, traditional you know, currency exchange company has a lot of the same legal and regulatory issues that we face um, because we're wanting to bank crypto companies. Mm -hmm. We're wanting to provide ex you know, trading accounts to the Krakens and Coinbases of the world. And we don't really know what that process should look like. We don't have we don't have a documented repeatable program to onboard those type of clients um, to make our regulators comfortable. And so that was really my first exposure to the whole crypto ecosystem. Um, I joined in, I think, early 2014, built out that banking program for cryptocurrency companies. We grew really quickly from one crypto company that was banking with us. A, a very large exchange um, within a year had about 75 cryptocurrency companies banking wow. through Silvergate. So that was my, that, I, that was really my aha moment when I saw and visited all of these companies and met with some of the founders of these large exchanges um, and really realized what a, what a booming industry this already was. And then looking back at this cash heavy company I was with, thinking, wow, like this is definitely the future. This is amazing how quickly money can move, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. And you're, and Silvergate, like you said, is just one of the banking powerhouses in the crypto market or industry, I should say. And you were there to help build that out. That's that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure yeah. you saw a lot of 
interesting uh, uh, setups and movements and, and placement of capital and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I was really writing these executive summaries for our um, executive team to look at that gave full overviews of all the companies. So I was digging into um, what their money transmitter license it, like approach was going to be state by state, who was um, looking to get the New York bit license. It was still kind of early days um, once that actually came out and I was there. Um, you know, what their consumer protection um, program looked like, what the what sort of pending litigation they were subject to. So I got this really neat bird's eye view of all these different companies and also worked with different um, departments within Silvergate to look at cybersecurity, information security, just to sort of understand these crypto companies full risk profile to tell Silvergate it's safe to bank and here's why, or these are the things this company needs to still do before we can start accepting them as a, as a banking customer. Um, so it was really, it was really neat um, to have that sort of bird's eye view and also get to sort of compare what, what similar businesses were doing differently from one another behind, you know, behind the scenes. So, um, and then from that, I, you know, getting acquainted with all these different companies is when I was recruited by Bitflyer to join. Um, so before Coinbase, I was at Bitflyer and they're the large, they're sort of the Coinbase of Japan. They're the largest exchange in Japan, but they wanted to expand into the US. So that's sort of how I really then joined one of these companies um, uh, and started to work on their compliance and regulatory um, program. And then you, you eventually found your way to Coinbase and, and then the rest is history. Then you uh, moved on. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. So I spent two years at Bitflyer. I was the, within the four founding US members. You know, it's sort of a, at that early stage when you're wearing multiple hats. I was doing compliance oh, yeah. and HR and um, getting all the state licenses, got the New York bit license. And then um, I, you know, really looked up to Brian Brooks, who was the chief legal officer at Coinbase at the time. Um, and we both were based in San Francisco and would grab coffee. And I just felt like um, really excited about the opportunity to work under him and, and, and get mentorship from him. So that's part of why I joined Coinbase. Obviously, they're an amazingly established company in the U.S. Um, so I joined Coinbase, and then he he left and went to the OCC, which is which was amazing for the industry as a whole. Um, and for me, then the opportunity with Anderson Kill arose to join as a partner and continue growing their um, cryptocurrency practice. So it was kind of you know, opportunities arose throughout throughout my path that have just made sense for the right time to move on. So two things you said there that really piqued my interest. One, yeah. Brian Brooks, I, I just an amazing guy. Obviously, like mm -hmm. you said, a massive legacy of the OCC. And uh, he's so articulate when he speaks about crypto. Right. Two, you helped a company get a bit license. I mean, how did you do it? Reveal your secrets because everybody's <laughs> trying to get a bit license. <laughs> I gave New York DFS my cell phone number and said, <laughs> if, if you see a single sentence in, in our application that you want to talk through, call me. I mean, I, I joined Bitflyer. I'm going to get all my dates wrong, but pretty much I joined in July. And from July through late November, I was interacting with New York DFS and working with an outside law firm at the time um, to just sort of be at their beck and call with any questions they had. Um, you know, part of the difficulty with the New York bit license is things like the cybersecurity requirements. Um, they really want to understand because they understand you know, hot and cold storage and how crypto is actually being stored by the organization. Um, and also just sort of everything that comes with, with cryptocurrency, how you're doing blockchain monitoring, how you're doing fraud prevention. 
So, so all of those things, you know, I was pretty, ex had already been exposed to a lot at Silvergate and, um, and we had a great team at Bitflyer. And so it was really just constantly being there to, to get questions answered. For sure. You know, it's, it, it, selfishly, I, I hope they get rid of the bit license, even though I understand, you know, there is a reason for it. And, and I yeah. certainly believe that, that, well, maybe they shouldn't get rid of it, but make it less, I don't know, intensive or scrutiny, yeah. level of scrutiny, because yeah. I feel like there's a lot of companies waiting in line. This line is getting longer and longer. And it's like, what's going on? You know? You yeah. Are... No, I, I think, I mean, I, I think if you actually talk to people at DFS, they'd say similar, not that we should get rid of it, but that they understand that, I mean, any agency really is always constrained by resources, people, time, the ability to review. And with New York, they really, since they want to, I mean, they've changed it a little bit in the last year or two, but they were wanting to approve every exchanges token by token that they would add um, oh. any new product or service. So if you want to add margin lending, if you want to add crypto lending, if you want to add staking, uh, yield, it, any sort of change to just traditional buy sell of crypto, um, those all need approval from New York DFS. And so once they approve someone for the bit license, it's not like, okay, we've, that's the 10th one onto the, the 11th. Then they add another company to their, you know, group that they have to oversee every step of the way. And I mean, one of the things I really circling back to the Brian Brooks topic is he, had a very forward thinking approach to how the OCC and like national banks should be regulated and um, where it wouldn't be like a product by product service by service approval. It's sort of like you are, uh, we're, we trust you to operate in this space and in a year we'll be in to examine you. And if anything's wrong, you're going to hear about it, but um, having such like being having such tight supervisory controls, I think, is makes it hard for DFS to sort of keep up with the, all the you know current applicants that are still trying to get the bit license. Um, Bitflyer was the fourth recipient, and I think we're now up to at least like twenty five. So we're making some progress, but you know, it's, it, it's still, there's a lot of companies that want to and should be able to operate in New York. For sure. Hopefully they can make some adjustments and, uh, you know, speed up the process. But like you said, it's a bit of resource constraint, uh, constraint as well. Right. Um, so tell us about Anderson Kill. I, you know, I was reading up on it at corporate law firm, but it seems like you're, you're helping crypto companies um, and, and folks mm -hmm. in the industry. Yeah, so Anderson Kill is really well known for its insurance practice. Um, a few years ago, Stephen Pally started the cryptocurrency digital asset group at Anderson Kill. Um, Preston Byrne, who's also a well known attorney in the space, joined, I think, about two years ago. I joined last year. So we're really um, very quickly growing out that practice. And we represent every sort of company in the space and occasionally individuals in the space, but mainly companies um, who are either very early on, even with the you know, entity formation, where they should be located, uh, what, what, the, what equity and things like that should look like. We represent NFT clients um, in terms of all the intellectual property and KYC questions that arise there. Um, and then sort of all the way to helping, you know, we helped a client recently apply for the OCC full, full national bank charter, um, helping clients get, get the 50 state money transmitter licenses mm -hmm. and the New York bit license. And also, um, companies really on how to develop their projects to stay out of any issues with the SEC. Um, on the back end, we are representing many clients um, in the, you know, sort of crypto, fintech, and DeFi space in terms of enforcement actions 
that aren't yet publicly known that the SEC is doing. So um, we kind of can help companies wherever they are in the um, in the line of, of of launching in the ecosystem. Now, I, I, I had a topic set for later for crypto regulations, but since you know you guys are in the mix of this, let, let's jump to that. Um, let's talk about U.S. crypto regulations. There's a lot here. Mm-hmm. SEC going after Ripple, Luna, they yeah. block Coinbase lending. Then you have the infrastructure bill. You know, right. g- give us your your take and your perspective um, on what's happening here and where do you see things moving uh, in the short term? Yeah, um, it's really hard. I think that the SEC has and will for a while continue to regulate through these enforcement actions rather than sort of proactively um, adding regulation or clarification to this space. So, you know, some a lot of people talk about the SEC, what is a security, what is not as sort of this gray area. But for, for my law firm in general, we, we err on the side of being fairly conservative that based on what we're seeing um, publicly and just within our practice, that the SEC is being pretty aggressive in who they're, um, you know, subpoenaing and coming after. Um, and, and that this is really a space that they intend to regulate pretty, pretty aggressively over the next few years. Um, there's been talks of safe harbor and things. I think I saw a podcast where you spoke with, um, with members, with Commissioner Peer uh, about the different aspects of that. But, um, you know, as of now, what we're seeing is that besides Bitcoin, I don't feel like the SEC is willing to make any sort of statements about other things not being securities. And when it comes to you know, not specifically Coinbase Yield. I wasn't there at the time when when they worked on that project, but any of these sort of yield pr- products, I think are, they look close enough to sort of a bank account and a savings deposit account that the SEC and other regulators get uncomfortable by non-banks offering that. Now, I guess what's interesting is that the purpose of these regulators really like what their marching orders are is consumer protection. And so sometimes I wonder if what they're, what they're ending up doing to the space is actually protecting consumers or harming them, but that doesn't change what, like what the regime looks like today. And so that's, that's what makes it difficult. I think for, companies in the space and attorneys in the space. It's really hard to have to tell a project. There's nothing inherently wrong with what you want to do, but under the current landscape, that's not gonna end well with the SEC or other regulators. Um, So, I mean, I'm I'm super optimistic about where we're headed in the US um, as the crypto industry continues to evolve. You know, we've seen futures and certain things finally get approved, still waiting on a Bitcoin spot ETF, but slowly but surely we're seeing some embracing of the technology and also some statements about it never being sort of banned outright in the US. And I think that those are positive things to look at um, and really, really just have to continue the, you know, part of my job I view is helping educate the general public and regulators about so some of the misconceptions about cryptocurrency. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you touched on a few things. It, it seems, you know, that some of the incumbents are fighting, which I, I guess it happens in every disruptive technology evolution or whatever you want to call it. And then the laws are outdated as well. If you're using an 80 year old law, how we test Maybe there needs to be a new version of that. Or maybe, while I don't like big government, another regulatory body that regulates crypto specifically. Yes. Yes. I think, I mean, based on my experience in, you know, BitFly or Coinbase, these sort of uh, exchanges that are in other jurisdictions as well. I mean, having to explain to our Japanese executive team when I was at BitFly why there were 50 states 
we got the bit license. Then the New York Attorney General gave that um, voluntary questionnaire to 13 exchanges. Bitflyer was one of them. And I remember my executive team was like, what's the New York Attorney General? I thought New York DFS was our regulator. You know, and that's just on the state level. And then you get on the federal. Um, whereas in Japan, like the FSA is the one regulator. They, mm. they dictate um, and in some ways it's maybe a negative because what they say goes, right? So they've pretty much banned privacy coins in Japan. That there's not certain states that a company can then offer privacy coins. A, and whereas here you can sort of geofence off New York or other states, but they also just regulate everything. And you don't have so many regulators to try to worry about and click through when you're thinking through a new product. I think that could be, I mean, when Brian Brooks was at the OCC, I thought that could be the direction we go, um, that more crypto companies become national banks and national trust charters. Um, but, and, and there was just recently, I think yesterday, a statement out from the OCC mm -hmm. sort of confirming, you know, not taking that back. And it still says national banks can get involved in crypto, but it, it did clarify or specify that the OCC needs to be alerted and approve that if a company wants to go that direction. So, you know, I think we're still as an industry, like still maturing. We have a lot of amazing working groups in um, DC, like Blockchain Association, Association of Digital Asset Markets, Coin Center. You know, we have these great um, working groups that are making, are being part of the conversation. So I think we're moving in a, in a good direction, but, um, yeah, the way we regulate crypto in the U S is really tough. Yeah. And it seems like to your point of lobbying, we, we need to get Congress on board because they, they will be the ones who can change the law and put the sec in. Okay. We'll put this, the, the, the guardrails to keep the sec at bay, so to speak. Um, right it seems like Congress has to make the move here. Yeah, I mean, what, what I'm seeing more is like the SEC getting more, more and more authority in the space. You know, they recently, they, they now, um, it's been sort of clarified that they'll be overseeing stable coins and that sort of thing. So I, I, I do think that there's a bit of like jurisdictional land grab that happens in the US, um, which in some ways is a good thing. Like my personal feeling is if any regulator or, you know, congressional hearing talks about Bitcoin, that means we're making a big impact, right? To be important enough to be worried about and talked about, but it still has to be uh, educated regulation or it's just going to continue making the industry harder to maneuver in. Now, I don't know if you've been uh, following the Ripple case closely. Um, there's some interesting updates happening there where the SEC, they seem to be in a bad position. Now, things could change. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, any thoughts on that and how that case is going? And, you know, it seems like depending on if, if Ripple were to come out of this successfully, it could set the precedence for the entire market. Yeah, I haven't been following mo like the most recent updates, so I can't speak to that um, in that much detail. But but what I will say is, I think honestly, regardless of the direction the case goes, if we can get some clarity from it, it will be a win for everybody. Um, you know, I think that, in my opinion, it's pretty unlikely that a regulator brings a weak case against a company. So if they're willing to continue to pursue this with with Ripple about XRP, I think they have, they feel like they have a good case regardless of how it's sort of evolving. But um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think both both sides, including Ripple, are spending a lot to to um, to make a good case in their defense. And um, like I said, I I just think that regardless it is always helpful to hear and get a little bit more clarity on, on things about that project that either are the, are the issue or aren't. Um, so, so I think it's really interesting. For sure. All right. Let's talk about crypto connect. 
how did the idea come about? And, uh, you know, maybe you can tell us about how it works and, and all the details there. Yeah. So yeah, I'm super excited about it. Crypto Connect is an idea I've had for, it's kind of started this year. So once I joined Anderson Kill and the vaccine started rolling out, I started traveling more and I found more and more that unless it was a place where we have an office or that I travel often, I was kind of just having to go to my Twitter to say, hey, I'll be in Nashville this weekend. Like who lives here? What companies are based here? Who wants to meet? Um, are there any events that I should come a week earlier or a week later? So I just felt like I really had to like ping into my network. And I, and I started to think like, how do other individuals who are busy or don't have as big of a network already sort of find their community when they move, move or travel or anything like that? And there's already like so many amazing Bitcoin and crypto meetups and things in different cities. So what Crypto Connect is intended to be is a, an additional resource for people, but sort of under an umbrella organization to where you can join um, sort of you, as a member of the city you're affiliated with. So you're near New York, you would be a Crypto Connect New York chapter men member. But eventually the website's going to be a really great resource for when you are traveling for work to ping into that another chapter where you're going. So it's a female led organization, a women led organization. There's, I believe, 26 uh, established women in the industry who sit on the board um, and in these city lead roles. We launched in 12 cities. And the idea is that even though it's women led, it's open to everyone. So membership is open to everyone. The events we've started to host in these 12 cities is open to everyone. Um, a secondary impact is that most of these events, I've seen more diversity, not just gender, but just more diversity in general, which has been really cool to see. Um, and so, yeah, we've just been since we launched, I think an early, um, late October, early November, and we started to have our first round of events in um, early November. We have a, our final four events early December, sort of for this quarter. And then we're going to enjoy the holidays, regroup as an organization and, um, and have some you know, plans for next year. That's awesome. I, I think you know, we were talking before the uh, recording and I had joined at Twitter Spaces you yeah. were doing about it. And I love the idea. It's something I thought about for a while, uh, meetup.com for crypto folks, mm -hmm. uh, because I've also thought about the same thing when I've traveled. I wonder if there's any crypto people here and can yeah. meet up with them and companies. Um, so I love the idea and it's really a great way for the community to come together. Yeah, I, I, it's been really, I mean, I think that the industry accepted like our launch in a really positive way. Um, I wanted it to bring people together, not be divisive or anything like that. Um, and the amount of interest we've had from, you know, we launched in, in sort of the 12 major cities I could think of, many of which I have traveled to, already knew people in New York, DC, Miami, LA, San Francisco, Austin, Dallas, you know, just sort of across the US in 12 cities. But we've had so much in enthusiasm about what when Boston, when Japan, when Australia, and uh, my um, th some of the emails I've gotten just from all over the world have like really blown my mind. And even in the Twitter spaces there that we hosted the day we launched, there were people calling in and from Kenya and Switzerland. And I mean, we have to figure out a way to keep expanding and building, but our plan is to launch in 12 more cities um, in Q1 of next year. So Boston, Salt Lake City, a few others. Um, but then I really want to figure out a way, the, the, per, the goal it was really like a decentralized organization that helps with professional development, networking, mentorship, job placement. And so I really, really like to figure out a way for it to be even more decentralized where every chapter sort of is its own little 
community and it hosts its events how it wants. Um, people can volunteer to be leads that can be male or female, you know, it doesn't matter gender background. Um, and, and we can just continue to like expand because I would love to, when I travel internationally to be able to ping into the community as well. I just think that would be such a cool way to, to continue breaking down sort of like borders and boundaries. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because like you said, there's just crypto holders around the globe and, and yeah. you know, you just see crypto popping up in different countries in Africa. And, and that's mm -hmm. awesome. If you're traveling in that direction, you get to right. meet up with, with local folks. That's awesome. Well, it's um, funny too, because I, we were, what we were speaking about too, before we, before we started recording is I just recently relocated closer to LA and Santa Barbara. I'm kind of back and forth. Um, and I went to, um, there's something called Crypto Mondays, which is a similar idea where it's in a lot of, a few different cities. And I went to the one here in Santa Barbara expecting like two or three people. And there was like 25 people. And I was like, this isn't incredible. And I just find that people that have a similar interest in crypto, it's sort of like that you already have one commonality. And so the conversations are just like, it's almost like instant friendship from that alone. And then you get to know each other better. So um, yeah, Bitcoin people are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, are you, are you a Bitcoin maximalist? <laughs> I'm not, I don't love, like, I don't love that term just because I feel like it insinuates that there isn't value in building outside of Bitcoin. And I think there are, I mean, I, um, my law firm, like I said, works with a lot of NFT clients. Um, I think there's some other cool projects. I mean, I, my portfolio is like 99% Bitcoin. It's what I personally invest the most in. Um, but that's also just my investment sort of strategy. And I don't like to sort of try to day trade or, um, buy really early on and then get a bunch, but, I, but I have some other coins in my portfolio. And I think there's some really cool projects out there like Solana basic attention token. I've always liked, um, I just recently wrote a Forbes article on privacy coins. I think those are really cool. So, I mean, some of those are built on sort of the Bitcoin foundation, but I think, I think there's a lot of cool stuff happening in the, in this space. I, I'm, a, I'm against the projects that I feel like aren't actually building anything. That's oh, yeah. I <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, there's, there's a lot of crap in the crypto market. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, if you don't have Bitcoin in your portfolio, I think that's a mistake. I think Bitcoin has been around the longest proven it can withstand and almost any attack. Yeah. Um, and it's people have tried to kill it and all kinds of things have happened. And, and it's really leading the charge for the crypto market. So I'm in agreement there with you. I have, I have all coins, of course. Yeah. Um, well, do you, do you have any NFTs by any chance? I don't. So, so there's a few that I'm interested in. I've been talking with um, a group. They're not a client, uh, but it's called Cuneiform. And they're doing NFTs in the, um, in the like independent film area. And then recently spoke with a potential company that I would work with that's doing NFTs with recipes with celebrity chefs. So oh, there's some okay. things like that that I'd probably be more interested in than where we sort of started that's more um, maybe like art work and, um, and so, some of more the membership type NFTs is, is where I'm sort of like forward looking. You mean you don't own any zany zebras or anything no, like that? Or ridiculous no eight, rhinos? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tweeted last week. I was like, maybe if you didn't make those apes so scary, I would want one. But they're always like melting away. And like, like it's just, I don't know. It's not, yeah. I, I also tweeted a while back, like I'd rather buy more Bitcoin than own an NFT. That's just, once again, like just my personal like investing strategy and it doesn't mean that i don't think some of these nft projects out there are super cool um yeah. and would be interested in in um you know supporting or or owning but i don't i don't currently um so i wanted to ask about and i i hope i got this correct i saw a photo post it was either by you or someone else 
or, or on the Crypto Connect Twitter feed, there, you mm-hmm. had the Miami meetup, mm-hmm. and then Hester Purse, SEC Hester mm-hmm. Purse uh, was mm-hmm. there. Yeah, so she came. We've it's funny we've had some um, pretty cool attendees at a few of our events. Um, she came and spoke, and um, I actually kind of found out about not. Not, I found out before the event, but it was sort of um, just happened to be the right timing with her in Miami, and she expressed interest in coming to speak. Uh, one of our board members, Leia, has a um, podcast talk show, so she also interviewed uh, Hester after the event, still at the same venue. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, she, you know, I I love the things that Hester's proposed. And I find it so um, nice for her to be such an authentic uh, sort of regulator in the space that's willing to just kind of come and be there. She took a lot of like Q&A at that event. And so it was very sort of like candid conversation. Um, And I just really respect any regulatory agency personnel that's willing to do that and she really knows her stuff so yeah she came to the Miami event um and it's just I mean we we weren't so the the intention is for crypto connect events to always have some form of educational piece to them whether it be a panel or fireside chat or a presentation um but for this first round I feel I felt like wow we bit off more than we can chew let's just throw like launch parties in these 12 cities um but what's great is that a lot of them sort of organically ended up having that educational component so in um in new york it happened to be during nft week nft new york and so and we had uh someone from gemini and the founder of lolly come uh and i moderated just a panel on sort of like product marketing and how you build consumer trust and branding in the industry. Um, Then we had Hester in Miami. We have um, Sarah Hody now speaking at our San Diego event um, in early December. She's an attorney that was also at Coinbase early in her career and now is at Perkins Coie. So it's just been really neat to see the way different cities events have unfolded and and sort of what they what the vibes been like and that they're all different in um, in different ways so it's cool yeah I, I love the education uh aspect of it because we're still so early and i feel you know if you invite people to come to it you want to make sure they leave with some knowledge or, and takeaways right. Right? versus okay they got a good drink they hung out but right yeah that's learn? my that's probably the biggest thing i um worry about in terms of letting crypto connect become too decentralized Mm. um, and letting sort of cities you know grow on themselves i want that level of autonomy for the organization but i also just want to make sure that the education is um like you said there's a lot of bad projects in the industry and i don't want any of any sort of educational components of crypto connect to ever be like shilling random projects <laughs> that, you know, like people kind of like leading and trying to sell the, like get their token out there, or get buy-in on something. So there's just a balancing act that we're, we're trying to find on how, um, yeah, how to, how to best like bring quality, um, quality events, quality people all together, um, and but then also make it so everyone feels included. For sure. Um, quick question on funding. How are, how are you funding these events? Is it crowdsourced? Is it sponsors? Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so so we're uh, we launched as a nonprofit and sponsors have supported these first round of events. Um, that's made it in a, in a way nice once again, because it does feel decentralized, but I think it's also added a difficult layer because every city lead has had to ensure that they have a pro that they find the venue that they find the sponsor. So I think towards the end of this year, we're going to have sort of a general board meeting to discuss sort of 
this is really a learning pro pro you know like i'm an attorney i've never founded a com a group or company before so we're learn it's sort of like trial by error um so i want to hear how how sort of this first round of events felt for everybody um if we're if we need more resources and more help if we maybe need like a nationwide sponsor that just sponsors the whole organization um or if eventually we do feel like we're I, I feel like we're bringing enough value to people that a membership dues would make sense, but I also didn't want costs to be prohibitive for anyone who wants to learn or get involved in this industry, because the same way I think like gender, race, diversity, like I think um, income diversity is important for us to be bringing into this too, because people, you know, with lower incomes actually can benefit a great deal from this um, technology and I don't want people to feel like they this isn't a place for them right yeah that's absolutely important right to be inclusive and uh, like okay lower income like you said this this is crypto is certainly a path out a way out and to help build financial freedom um, and to opt out of maybe constraints that have been put in there by the traditional uh, markets and so forth. And that's why we didn't call it like women in Bitcoin and focus too much on gender or, um, you know, our sort of like the purpose of the organization isn't diversity. It's, it's and it, and, you know, even inclusion feels like a little bit too much of a buzzword. It's just that crypto is for everybody. Cryptos yeah. for everyone, so no one should feel unwelcomed to walk to come to one of these events and just meet like-minded people, and hopefully, you know, continue to to educate and be more informed when they when they leave. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's switch gears and talk about the crypto market. And uh, I I, I got to ask, uh, you know, what do you think about the current market growth and you know, Bitcoin's trajectory, do you feel we're still in the bull market? We're going to see new all-time highs coming soon. Any thoughts on that? I'm always a little, it's funny, I've been in this space a long time and I've held crypt, I've held Bitcoin a really long time. I'm still always a little bit unsure of where we're headed. Um, and I try to not focus too much on the price, to be honest, but I certainly feel like the industry as a whole is headed for, for, a lot of great price activity. Um, you know, when I hear estimates like 200,000 in the next year or two, like that, that won't surprise me at all. Um, I remember when I was at Bitflyer, the price going from, from 3K to 20K the day we launched, or, you know, maybe, maybe it had already started to go up towards like 10K, but the day we launched, it finally hit 20K. And we were just so overwhelmed because that means more users tend to come to these platforms. Um, so, you know, the, the, the highs and lows don't worry me. Like, I feel like that's part of the journey. It's something I try to talk and educate newcomers and friends who are interested about. Like, well, if you buy all in at 60K and tomorrow it's 55, like, don't <laughs> freak out, <laughs> you know, don't like kick yourself. But, um, but yeah, I, I think it's going to be, um, I, you know, I feel like around the holidays, sometimes the price peaks a little, and I don't know if that's, I'm not a day trader. I don't specialize in this. I don't know if that's because people are buying a little for the holidays or I don't know what it is, but, um, I think we'll see some good price action in the next few months. And then especially, um, maybe the next official bull run where we've already found sort of I feel like we're starting to see stabilization around in between like 40 and 60. Um, and that's pretty incredible to me because I remember when Bitcoin was much, much, much lower <laughs> and we were still excited about it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's an exciting time and we'll see what happens. Um, and there's adoption happening you know, around the globe. Uh, in the United States, what's interesting after China banned Bitcoin mining, we saw the miners disperse around the world. A lot of them came to the United States, and now we're seeing Bitcoin mining boom in the United States. I've interviewed some mm -hmm. miners. Uh, big things happening in Texas. You know, what are your thoughts on that? And and uh, are you guys working with any miners? I don't know if that 
is in line with your, you know. Yeah, yeah. We certainly talk with a lot of miners about potentially working with them. The, you know, the, any any company, even if they aren't, don't have crazy regulatory issues, they still have day to day legal business transactional uh, work for for law firms. But um, yeah, I mean, because I'm from Texas, I'm so excited about. Uh, especially just like the direction Austin's been moving. Um, but, you know, there's uh, the Texas Blockchain Association is doing a lot of great work within this space. One of their leaders is um, is our Dallas lead through Crypto Connect. So I've kind of been following it closely just because I find my grandfather was an oil attorney in Texas. Okay. And I kind of find this very interesting um sort of overlap with this idea of Bitcoin mining becoming a big thing in Texas now, you know, it's sort of, it's very different, but it's, but it's, it's, there's, there's many things that can be compared. Um, I, I think it's great. I mean, I think that what that showed is that, that a country trying to ban a certain um, type of crypto activity doesn't, in well right because it just leaves um it doesn't disappear and i think actually the u.s has a lot to learn from that because we i have clients that come and say you know we want to hire you just to figure out how to make sure we're geofencing off the u.s correctly wow that doesn't look good right like that's just there should be a solution. So I thought that was really interesting that that mining sort of migrated everywhere, including Austin. I think I've had some interesting uh, conversations with people in um, Costa Rica who who feel like they have a lot of sort of extra excess energy that they would like to put towards mining. So I think we're going to continue seeing all of that. Um, I think all of the different st you know states, cities like Miami and Austin that are sort of embracing the different innovative aspects of crypto, it, it's a smart play. Yeah, it's it's exciting to see this uh, happening. Um, and uh, you know, I've been here since 2016, and yeah, it just is such a 180 from what was happening back then and what was being said. And it's just amazing to see this industry grow in multiple fronts. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on El Salvador? and what they're doing. Uh, President Bukele, the uh, $1 billion bond, going to mine Bitcoin with volcano, yeah. volcanic energy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, so it sounds crazier than it is, right? Yeah. I mean, um, it sounds more futuristic, but it's here already. Um, you know, I think that, it, I think El Salvador making crypto legal tender is a huge step for the crypto space. Um, I think that for the U.S. to do something similar, we're far, far away away from that um, because the U.S. really likes having control of monetary policy and the U.S. dollar has a lot of power still. Um, but, you know, I think that we'll continue to see countries embracing the space like that. Um, and I think that El Salvador is doing it in a, in a smart way. You know, I don't think that they're being to um i think i think they're thinking through what they're doing um i haven't dug too much into the bitcoin city is that what they, it's, they're calling it bitcoin yeah i believe believe yeah where yeah zero percent tax or whatever yeah doing. i mean it'll just be interesting to see what it's like but I, i've had i've never i haven't personally gone to el salvador I, i'd love to i've heard people who've gone there within the industry have just like just been really blown away by the people there and the interest that's there in crypto. Um, and it's just, uh, to me, another example of how crypto really is for everyone. And different countries may find different use cases for cryptocurrency. Maybe, maybe in the US for a while, it won't be used as sort of a form of payment because our banking system, we have to wait three to five business days. It's closed on holidays, but it still works, you know. Yep. You still can trust that money will be in your bank account on Monday when you want, when you need it. But what we're seeing with inflation and things, you know, maybe that, maybe that trust is going to erode quicker than, than, you know, I would have said a few years ago. So, but I think it's great what's happening there. Um, any sort of embracing of crypto in a, 
in a reasonable sort of uh, cautious manner, I think is, is really great for the industry. For sure. And I, I, I'm very curious to see who's the next country to follow El Salvador's move. And like you said, it won't be like, yeah. you know, a first world US, you know, UK yeah. movers, but maybe more countries in Latin America, right? Who, who mm-hmm. are facing certain economic issues and so forth and this could really help them help them. right i think i think that i mean i think the i think the value it brings to like remittance the the amount of friction that that companies and individuals face when just trying to send money to another country i mean there's just so much value in this technology um that and sometimes i think that part gets lost in the u.s like when i talk to people who aren't in the industry they're sort of like well, isn't it kind of like PayPal, you know, and you're like, no, it's not, it's not at all. Um, and you start to explain the, you know, the, that, you, that you're getting rid of the intermediary sort of banking industry, that there's other countries where like people are really unbanked, right? They can't get bank accounts. Entire sort of societies don't have a, like this gives them a way to create uh, a barter system to to have an economy and that's pretty crazy for sure um i want to ask a question about DeFi, and then we'll wrap it up with, with some um, fun questions you know what are your thoughts on DeFi? I, I think before the recording i said look it's version 1.0 it's like web 1.0 there was a lot of flaws and uh, loopholes and all kinds of security issues it seems yeah. that's the way it's happening right now what do you think about DeFi in the future yeah i think so i mean I agree with you on that. I think we have a ways to go. Um, I think that a lot of projects that sort of assert that they're decentralized, a decentralized exchange, um, DeFi, I think we still have a ways to go until a lot of these companies really are sufficiently decentralized to where they don't need to comply with some of the traditional regulatory oversight. Um, I think that some of the DeFi projects in the space likely will will experience some of the same regulatory issues that um, sort of the crypto space in general has. Um, for me also, like I get almost confused by the term DeFi because like it means decentralized finance. That's such a broad sort of terminology. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think we just have a long way to go before we sort of like define what that industry looks like and how it should be regulated or how it can avoid regulation. I lied. There was one question I just remembered that I want to ask you because you, you have the legal perspective. Okay. C- CBDCs are coming. Every central bank is building them. Um, yeah. One of the things I've talked to with Chris Giancarlo, part of the Digital Dollar Project, is yeah. how does that align with the constitution and our right to privacy? Hmm. I want to get your, your perspective on that because it's coming. Yeah, I don't think there's yeah. any way to stop it, but we at least have an alternative with Bitcoin and other cryptos, but right. what are your thoughts? No, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I, like I mentioned a little earlier, I recently wrote a Forbes article on, on privacy coins. And part of that was sort of this co- constitutional argument that in, especially in the United States, it's very, um, there's no question on why people want privacy in certain areas. When it comes to financial privacy, all of a sudden, regulators tend to think privacy means secrecy, right? Like it means you have something to hide. Um, so I, I think we'll, there'll be a ways to go. I mean, I, I do think that's the direction we're heading. My hope would be that if there was ever sort of a, besides just the CBDCs, like if we actually get to a space of like a, the digital dollar or something that these that these organizations and the government would be relying on companies who have already sort of like perfected that technology instead of trying to be the builders and creators of it. Um, But when it comes to financial privacy, like that is uh, an area where there's really a struggle happening, right? Because like FATF and different regulators are even trying to start overseeing unhosted wallets. Like a regulator couldn't come up to me and say, who did you just pay $10 to out of your wallet? And how much more do you have in there? That's like, right? That's a ridiculous yeah. idea. So um, 
sort of bridging the gap of regulators thinking cryptocurrency is like this shady underworld where we're all trying to just not pay taxes and hide what we're doing um, and really start to understand like the value and importance of privacy, even just for like from a national security perspective. I mean, in my article, I talked about how the internet is encrypted now and back a long time ago, the there were plenty of um, sort of regulators or oversight where they didn't really like this idea of encryption on the internet. Well, if you don't have that, people are going to steal your credit card <laughs> number and there's right. going to be theft. Um, and so, yeah, there, I, I think that we, I think privacy coins um, and, um, and, and financial privacy is still a conversation that we have a long ways to go about. Yeah. Uh, we got to get it right and because i know in china they 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 want to view everything and, and have right. your social score but i don't yeah. think that's going to fly here but we'll see no. <laughs> and no and it shouldn't i mean it really shouldn't because the problem is is that when you increase surveillance of somebody um you're increasing surveillance of everybody and you know who usually gets around that are the bad actors that go back to just using dollar bills and so individuals who just appreciate um, the government staying out of their business, like that's a fair thing to feel. Um, so we do need to find that right balance. Um, uh, and, and yeah, I, I actually just spoke with Chris Giancarlo the other day about another Forbes article I'm writing. And I, I think he's brilliant. I think um, I, I, I'd like, I would, really like him and people like Brian Brooks to be a part of <laughs> part of the future of where we're headed. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm a big fan of Chris crypto dad, of course. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I know he's trying to push the, the conversation and, and to make sure we have proper dialogue around these things. Yeah. All right. Um, I want to wrap it up here with some fun questions. If you yeah. could create your own metaverse, what would it be about? I know. I love that question. <laughs> I was trying to think what that, um, I'm not sure. I mean, it would probably be something vacation related or I'm really nerdy when it comes to organizing, <laughs> like home organizing Marie Kondo. <laughs> okay. um, so something about that. I'm not quite sure what that would look like, but my brain really doesn't think in terms of metaverse yet. So I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we still got ways to go, right? To get people to buy in. I know Facebook, Zuckerberg, wants, yeah. he's right to well, get everybody involved. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because I, um, I mean, one of the first projects I looked at in the early days of my career was um, uh, Second Life, you know, and back then, like, I, it was a company that I was looking at in terms of their use of cryptocurrency in their game. Um, so when I hear metaverse, I sort of start to think of like a second life almost. I'm not sure if that's, I think everyone might have their own definition of what metaverse looks like. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. It's, there's still a lot to see what's going to be built and what use cases and how we're going to interact with it. Um, I would prefer anyone but Facebook control <laughs> yes. what that looks like, but uh, I'll leave that out. <laughs> For sure. All right. Quick rapid fire questions. Favorite okay. food pizza favorite musician or band i like all music but i think because of my dallas roots i really like country but i like rap and uh soul so i'm not i like uh, maybe amy winehouse is up there or you know formerly amy winehouse favorite movie let's see um i really like uh silver lining playbook mm. um i like big fish um yeah, those are probably my top two. Favorite book? I, it's funny, after law school, didn't read as much because law school is so, <laughs> um, I love to cook. And so in my free time, I really like to read cookbooks and the stories behind them, especially from like other countries and um, sort of the background story behind different ingredients and recipes and that sort of thing. Well, I think you might, you might have answered my last question about your favorite hobby or pastime. It sounds like cooking might be. Yeah, I love cooking. Um, uh, I, I'm in California. I love walking on the beach with my dog. Um, I like painting. I think those are my three. 
Haley, a uh, pleasure chatting with you and uh, so much knowledge from your end. And I'm excited for Crypto Connect. Uh, I you. certainly want to participate. So we'll talk more about that offline. Yeah. Th thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thank you. I'm very happy to have your support of the group and your involvement. So, um, and thanks for having me on. Thank you.